five. So first of all, I wanted to ask you about the game today. Normally, I would say Chelsea would be the stars of the show in a game like today. But today, really, it's Fulham sat in seventh. So I wanted to ask you just how impressive have Fulham been this season? I saw their opening Premier League game of the season. They played Liverpool at the, at the Cottage. And they were not only good value for a point that day, but I was really surprised by the physical intensity that they showed and maintained throughout that game. They outran Liverpool that day and not many teams outrun Liverpool. So they came up with a nucleus, obviously, of a successful team. OK, they've been up and down for the last five seasons. They did make 11 acquisitions in the end in the summer, which they did two years ago to no avail. But this time, I think Marco Silva is the, the, the star of the show. He's bought well. He's played pretty much the same team in every game, good consistency. Um, Mitrovic has scored goals in the Premier League, which probably people didn't think that he could do. They mix the game up, but they're not frightened to cross the ball and make the most of what he gives them. And uh, you've only got to look at their league position, where more than halfway through the season, the table doesn't lie. And there they are now with a chance to go into the top six tonight. You spoke about 11 acquisitions for Fulham. £300 million spent for Chelsea in the window just then. So I wanted to ask you, after not a brilliant start by many people's standards for Graham Potter, how much added pressure does that amount of money get spent on him? It's a transfer window, the kind of which we've, we've not seen before. Um, I can remember when Roman Abramovich first arrived here and basically said to Claudio Ranieri and Jose Mourinho, have who you want. Mm. And they did. You know, they bought Drogba and Veron and Shevchenko, et cetera, et cetera. This is a little bit different. They bought very young. I mean, of the six players that have come in, in during the course of January, 22 years and a few days is the oldest. Mm. Enzo uh, Fernandez and Mudrik are just, have only just turned 22. They've given them six, seven, eight-year contracts, A, to spread out the transfer fees, but also to make a commitment to the future. The, the big question marks really are, are these players that Graham Potter has chosen mm. or have they been chosen for him? Mm. And given that managers' futures are the next 90 minutes, mm -hmm. is he going to have enough time to see these 20, 21, 22-year-olds come into their prime? They haven't bought a centre forward. Uh, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, they've just left Aubameyang out of their Champions League squad. They haven't really got a centre forward. Havertz is playing there. Mm -hmm. So it all seems a bit scattergun, a bit unbalanced, but they brought a lot of talented players and players for the future. Within your extensive career, what's the greatest atmosphere you've ever experienced? Well, you can't beat a football match under lights, so um, night matches you tend almost automatically to think about big European games, mm -hmm. Champions League games. I think Anfield and Celtic Park are both very, very special on a major European night. Somehow the connection between the football club and the fans transcends that at virtually anywhere else I've known. I mean, I've seen wild atmospheres in Turkey and Greece, but in terms of the actual engagement with the football club, I think Liverpool and Celtic have got a history of getting that right. And that creates an atmosphere which, you know, gives a genuine home advantage. Home advantage isn't always cracked up to be sometimes, particularly if you're not playing very well, you, you're under pressure from the first mistake, but the positivity that you, that you get and that element of intimidation for the opponent walking out into that atmosphere, seeing you'll never walk alone, sung at both grounds uh, beforehand. Yeah, I mean, a Champions League night at Anfield or Celtic Park. When there's a massive pressure moment, so maybe a penalty or a free kick in the last minute, and you're commentating on it, how much of that pressure do you inherit to perform in your role? The drama is in, in the moment, in the theatre that football has created. And if we've got a last-minute penalty which is going to settle a game, you actually don't need to say a great deal. A bit of information, maybe about the penalty taker and about the goalkeeper and their penalty records. A bit of context, what the result will mean, so what the next kick of the ball means. I don't know, probably the most famous goals I've ever commentated on were the two that Manchester United scored at the right at the very end of the 1999 Champions League final. I didn't say anything for about eight or nine seconds after each of those goals, shouted the name of the goal scorer. Those next eight or nine seconds of thinking time, it's not a rest. You're not just shutting up for the sake of it. You're trying to find the words which will decorate the moment 
with the importance, the significance that it deserves mm. because it's going to be played time and time again. So concentration is the key, trying to find the right words for the right moment. That's all we do. And sometimes the right words are none at all. And you speak about the right words. So for someone that's looking to get into commentary, a young, aspiring commentator, what kind of advice would you have for them? Bring yourself to the party. That's the most important thing. By all means, um, watch and listen to live sport on TV and on radio and ask yourself why you like certain people and why you don't, what it is you like about them, but don't try to copy them. Ask yourself what you know, how they connect with you, how they communicate with you, and then use their methods um, to uh, and adapt them to your own personality. It's very important you bring yourself to the occasion and, and with it all the, the enthusiasm um, that you have f for the game. The, 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 only, the only real no-no for a commentator is to make it sound like you don't want to be there. Mm. Make it sound like it's wasting your time. Mm. And a bad match is a bad match and you can call it a bad match, but you're talking to thousands, maybe millions of people who would very gladly swap places with you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in an instance. So, um, yeah, bring yourself and your enthusiasm to the party. So you've been the voice of FIFA for in excess of 10 years now. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that and how the recording process was and, and how that came about. I haven't done FIFA for about 10 years. I did it for about 10 years prior to that. It's as hard as I, I've worked, really, in so much that the recording of the, the game um, audio track is usually done over five days, five eight-hour days in London, plus a big strain on your voice. I would never ever have done it when I had another game coming up three or four days later. I actually went to Vancouver where it's made and did a couple of workshops with the people who make it. The danger really is that you try to overwrite it. And actually, very much like television, it's a, it's a visual experience for, for the game player. You can play it without the commentary. Mm. So the commentary should only really be background music, apt background music. You know, I always say that if you, if you go into an Italian restaurant and they're playing some kind of Italian accordion music in the background, you hardly notice it. If they suddenly started playing some Japanese music, you think, what? I'm trying to eat Italian food here. You're playing Japanese music. Commentary is a bit like that. I mean, we shouldn't get, ever get in the way of your, of your visual enjoyment of what you're watching, be it a live game on TV or um, a virtual game uh, during the playing of FIFA. So I, I kind of water, or tempered down the, the, the script for, for FIFA and tried to deliver it as I would uh, a television uh, commentary. But when you spend a whole day shouting players' names out, uh, you go home exhausted <laughs> and a little bit mad. <laughs>